Okay, we have our first uh, speaker of the uh, post poster session, uh, Jennifer Garrison from the Buck, who will talk to us about reproductive longevity. I think. You think? Maybe. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, and thank you to the organizers for um, a really spectacular meeting so far. Um, and I'm excited to meet all of you, hopefully, after this. Um, so I'm a faculty member at the Buck Institute, and I'm going to talk today mostly not about the work in my lab, but I did want to just put in a plug for my lab very quickly. Um, so I'm a neuroscientist by training, and I'm really interested in trying to understand how cell cellular and circuit mechanisms that control homeostatic systems in the brain may contribute to systemic aging. So in mammalian uh, brains, the hypothalamus is the control center for homeostasis. It controls everything from energy and fluid balance to reproductive function to circadian rhythms and body temperature regulation. And I really think about this part of the brain as a master regulator for systemic aging. So Dong Shenkai and others have shown that there's an age-related increase in inflammation in the hypothalamus. And we think about dysregulation of those homeostatic circuits as maybe the first domino to fall when we talk about aging. Um, and of course, things like reproductive function in females are one of the earliest overt signs of aging that we observe in the body. So if this is a, a master regulator for systemic aging, then all of the cellular and circuit mechanisms operating there are prime targets for anti-aging interventions. Um, it's also a really cool part of the brain. So the neurons in this area control not just the physiology, but also the associated behaviors. So for things like circadian rhythm, they control sleep. For energy homeostasis, they control feeding. And it is the most neurochemically diverse part of the brain, and it makes and uses a lot of neuropeptides. So this is a silly cartoon, but if you don't remember anything else about what my lab does, this is what we do. We work on trying to understand how neuropeptidergic signaling, which essentially acts like the brain's Wi-Fi, communicates between brain regions and also between uh, the periphery and in both directions. Um, so what we do in my lab is we use worms and mice and now sometimes humans to look at these circuits, to ask how they change with age, to measure in real time both, um, both the neural activity and the neuropeptides that are changing using mass spec. So I wear a lot of different hats, and um, now I'm going to switch gears and talk to you about reproductive longevity and some of the initiatives that we've built at the Buck Institute recently. So we're all very familiar with this graph, and um, we had some really beautiful talks this morning discussing how organ systems are, are aging, um, some at different rates. But in general, the stereotypic decline that we see with age across all of our organ systems is, is pretty much like we see in this graph. Female reproductive uh, systems, however, fall off this graph in a really dramatic way, um, with female fertility and ovaries aging at over two and a half times the rate of the tissues in the rest of the body. Now, while women live longer on average than men, they spend much more of their lives in poor health. And so um, we think about reproductive aging, oops, sorry, my slides are out of order. Um, I'm going to start here. We think about reproductive aging as um, being essentially a, a pacemaker for aging in, in a woman's body. So ovaries are aging at about two and a half times the rate of the rest of the tissues. And um, this can uh, essentially lead to all sorts of health problems. When a woman is in her late 20s, early 30s, her ovaries are actually already, already showing overt signs of aging when the rest of her tissues are functioning at what could be considered peak performance. I'm going to pop back here. Um, and this is something I didn't know until I started working in this space, but you know, female humans are born with all of the eggs that they'll ever have. Unlike men who continue to pr produce sperm throughout their lives, um, Around 26 weeks gestation, a woman has all of the eggs that she will ever have. Um, and this means that essentially, although I was born in the 1970s, the egg that I came from was made in my mother's or my grandmother's womb in 1956. Um, so it's kind of like sci-fi <laughs> and super cool, actually. But by the time I was born, um, that number had declined to about a million. Um, and on average, by the time a human female enters uh, puberty, that number has gone down to about 350,000. And then once a woman starts cycling, she loses about 1,000 eggs every month until she runs out of eggs and goes through menopause. 
And um, this, this graph, which I think we're all familiar with, um, shows not just a decline in egg number, but also a decline in egg quality with age. So we know this happens. We don't know why it happens. We don't know what causes it. And so everything that we're doing is aimed at trying to understand where along this trajectory um, the causal factor or cues or timers or constellation of cues and timers happens that so reproducibly tells a woman's ovaries to start aging so early. I already told you this. <laughs> um, so in young women, you know, we, we are very well aware of what happens as a result of the aging of uh, that that age-related decline in egg number and quality, and that's infertility, things like miscarriages, and, uh, and birth defects. But once a woman's gone through menopause, even healthy women, this has a dramatic impact on overall health. Right? So we're not just talking about fertility here, we're talking about health, women's health. Um, and so going through menopause and losing those hormones that ovaries make that are so important for general health leads to a dramatic increase in all sorts of things, uh, risk of heart disease, stroke, cognitive decline, all the things I've listed here and more um, increase dramatically after menopause. And so we think about this not just as a, a health issue, but also as an issue of equality. Because for every woman on the planet, if they're lucky enough to live to midlife, they will experience menopause. And this has impacts on um, you know, quality of life. It has impacts on career and family planning. Um, whether or not a woman wants to have biological children, I don't have biological children. I didn't want to have biological children. But I had, in the back of my mind, from the moment I entered adulthood, I had this ticking biological clock in the background. Men don't have that. And so we're tackling something that we think of as a societal inequity. And as we work, all of us, to extend healthy longevity, if we don't address reproductive longevity, then we're going to make gender inequality worse and not better. And that's because soon women are going to be living more of their lives after menopause in this compromised health state than before. Um, so we also have uh, really good evidence, and we heard this morning from Andrea Meyer, that menopause can accelerate biological aging. Um, so this is something that we think is a really important thing to tackle. There's also a lot of things about it that we don't understand. This is one thing that I think is super cool, but again, we don't know why this is true. But age at menopause correlates with overall lifespan, so women who live longer, um, or women who go through menopause later tend to live longer. Um, and if you look at the x-axis here, normal menopause, um, so the age of normal menopause spans 14 years. Now, there's no other signature in human health that's so variable at the level of the individual. So we don't know why it's so variable at the level of the individual, and we don't know why it correlates with overall lifespan. But we do know that brothers of women who go through menopause later also tend to live longer. So there's a genetic component here that's important not just for women, but also for men. And I would argue that understanding how and why ovaries age prematurely will give us a lot of clues about aging in the rest of the body, because the pathways that we know about that are important for longevity and other tissues, things like mTOR signaling, um, uh, anti-aging interventions like metformin or uh, NAD boosters, these all have a positive impact on ovarian aging too. Um, humans are extremely weird <laughs> um, in the animal kingdom, so there's almost no other species that go through a true menopause. It's us and four species of whale. And there's a couple of non-human primates that exhibit some characteristics of menopause, but not others. Um, but why is it that it's, you know, why is it that we, we go through menopause at all? Um, it, what this tells me is that it's not a biological imperative, that it's not necessary. Um, so why do we have it at all? Why does it vary at the level of the individual? Why is it correlated with overall lifespan? And what causes it to begin with? Um, I was writing a piece for a popular science magazine um, for, the, for the lay audience, and the editor came back to me and highlighted a phrase I wrote, which was, ovaries age prematurely. And he said, can you please expand on this and explain why? <laughs> And I was like, no, actually, if I could answer that question, then, then we wouldn't be talking about this. Um, but it's really, you know, it's really a mystery why this is happening. Um, and I think these are basic, basic fundamental science questions. There's no reason we can't answer them. It's just that we haven't been working in this space. We haven't been addressing these issues. We haven't been doing the research. Um, and that's for a lot of reasons. I think persistent societal taboos. Um, 
and really significant bias in biomedical research are, are part of the reasons why we haven't attacked this. So, you know, for the last hundred years, uh, the male body has been biology's baseline. Um, it was only a few years ago that the NIH mandated that, that grantees use both uh, males and females animals in their studies. Um, and this has had a lot of different impacts on women. Um, one that I highlighted here is just that 80% of the drugs in the U.S. that are pulled from the market because of safety issues are pulled from the market because of adverse effects in women. And this is because the testing happens mostly in males. Um, so this is changing thankfully, um, but not fast enough. And this is one of the reasons that we're so behind in this space. Um, this is data from funding uh, for the NIH, which is the world's largest public biomedical research funding organization. Um, in 2018, they spent about 15% of their overall budget on women's health. Um, that would be from conception through death. And of that, about 0.2% was dedicated to projects that I considered female reproductive aging, and I was very generous in what I called that. Um, so there's, you know, underfunding, there's this persistent bias in um, the sexes that have been used in studies. And, um, you know, we're thinking about trying to tackle that. So there's also, if you don't have a, f a woman in your life that you care about, and you're not buying what I say about this being important for men too, there's a really dramatic, profound cost, economic cost of menopause that's only going to increase as more women enter menopause. So by 2025, it's estimated that over a billion women will be actively in menopause in the world. That's gonna be 12% of the world's population. And that translates into real annual healthcare costs from all of those uh, health risks that I described, but also economic costs due to lost productivity. Because when a woman is going through perimenopause, leading up to menopause, there are vasomotor symptoms that we tend to, you know, kind of sweep under the rug. Things like hot flashes and brain fog that lead to like truly, truly profound impacts on a woman's quality of life. And a lot of women actually end up either not working or leaving their jobs because of this. Um, so here's the, here's the problem. <laughs> um, we wanna try to figure out where along this trajectory the actual causal factors for menopause are happening and reproductive decline in ovaries. Um, and the goal would be, you know, a moonshot would be to figure out why it's happening and to get rid of it. But honestly, what we really want to do is just to understand how and why it's happening so that we can extend the number of healthy eggs that a woman has around age 40 by one or two percent. That would be a game changer, not just for fertility, but also for overall health. So a few years ago, with the help and the vision of Nicole Shanahan and the Biaco Foundation, we started a couple of initiatives um, to try to tackle this. So the first is a center, and the Center for Reproductive Longevity and Equality is, is based at the Buck Institute. It is a group of scientists who are actively working to try to understand questions related to ovarian aging. And um, when we started the center in 2018, um, it became immediately apparent that if we were gonna make an impact, we had to do something very much bigger. Um, we had a hard time even finding faculty to hire because there are plenty of people, especially in this room, who are working on aging science. Um, plenty of people working on reproductive biology, but very few at the interface. So in that moment, um, again, with seed funding from the Biaco Foundation, we started a global consortium um, for reproductive longevity and equality. And our goal truly is just to facilitate and accelerate moving discoveries from the bench into women's hands faster. And so we're doing a lot of things towards this goal that I'll describe, but the, the basis for what we're doing is trying to bring every single person who has an interest in this space, that means scientists and clinicians for sure, people who are working in industry, but also you know, funders, um, people who happen to be in a position to give away grants, um, literally anyone who can, who can work towards this goal. Um, so this is a little bit of a busy slide, but these are the kinds of things that we're trying to do to facilitate this. So task number one for us was funding. So we give away grants to basic scientists, um, and I think that is the, the core and the most important thing that we're doing right now. Um, 
in, in addition to that, we're trying to do things differently. So since we're building this from the beginning, we can you know, identify the things that haven't worked in the past and try to change them. Um, so we're forcing interactions between people who don't normally communicate. And in this case, that really means clinicians, getting um, clinicians and basic researchers to talk to each other. And a lot of times now, we're, we're facilitating that bridge, building out a network, um, and doing a bunch of other things that I can talk about later if you're interested. We gave away our first grants in 2020 to 23 scientists all over the world. And we tried to implement a, a novel granting process. We have a scientific advisory board of experts in both areas of science. Um, we had a fast and very short application. And we uh, had a step that made the reviewers blind to both gender and institution. And as a result, over 80% of our grantees are women. And, and they come from all over the world. We skipped a year for COVID, um, but we're about to announce the next round. Um, but these are the kinds of projects that we funded. We're very broad in what we consider um, ovarian aging because we really don't know, we don't know what we don't know. And we don't know where we're gonna find um, that really important, those really important discoveries. Um, you can go to our website to, to read about the grantee projects. The other thing we did is we opened uh, the world's first reproductive biology core facility. So this is meant to bring people in from outside the space. You don't know how to work on ovaries, but you're interested. We have a core facility like a genomics facility that can work with you. Um, we also, uh, Bia Echo also opened another center in Singapore, so the Asia, uh, the Asian Center for Reproductive Longevity and Equality at NUS. Um, we had our first conference, so we went from almost nobody working on this to over 100 people at our conference in uh, June, and we'll have this every year. There's a special issue of JARA Science dedicated to reproductive aging associated with the conference, so if you have any papers, please send them to us. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of these things that we're doing, but uh, we're, we're trying as hard as we can to make this a really sustainable research field, um, and I would love to talk to you about it more. I already told you that we're uh, going to announce the next round of grants soon. Our website has a lot of, uh, a lot of resources on it that we're constantly building out. Um, and finally, I would say for people in this audience who are interested in um, company building and investing, the global menopause market right now, this is from 2021, is enormous. Um, and there aren't very many companies addressing this. And so there's a huge opportunity here. Um, and I, I would also say that that all the companies that I know about, with the exception of a few that I can count on my fingers, and you'll hear from one of them right after me, they're all working on treating the symptoms of menopause, which is important. Like, don't get me wrong. This is very important. It's a Band-Aid, but it's a Band-Aid that we really need. Um, but I would encourage people who are interested in funding companies in this space to, to hold on and to think about waiting until the IP is generated from the science that we're trying to fund. Um, because there's a big rush to fund things in this space, and, and the, the causative factors, we don't have a clue what they are. Um, so, last but not least, um, I think ovaries present a really unique opportunity for us to think about how to do longevity trials for interventions in humans. It's an accelerated model for human aging. So you could imagine testing a longevity intervention on a woman in her 30s with endpoints that are very simple to measure, things like pregnant, not pregnant, hormone levels, bone density, things that are very easy to measure. Um, so I'm not saying that, 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 that it'll work necessarily, but it's an idea to consider. Um, I, didn't, I didn't tell you this ahead of time, but um, I just wanted to make my own announcement, which is that um, the MBL aging biology course is coming back. Um, so <laughs> yeah, it went away when the Ellison Medical Foundation decided to stop funding biomedical research in 20. 13, 2014, I can't remember. It was before my time. Um, but Will, Mary, and I have restarted it. We've got a really generous gift from an individual to fund the whole thing for the year. And we'll open it up for PhD and, uh, students and postdocs to apply to in later this year. And then it'll start next July, and it'll be every year going forward. So I'm super excited about that. Um, and finally, there's a white paper on our website. and um, 
we need ambassadors. So we want every single one of you to be part of our consortium. We want you to talk about this. I think that as, as important as this issue is globally, it should be something that people talk about over dinner. Um, and so we need to bring it into the public sphere in a way that it is not right now. Um, with that, I would thank uh, Nicole Shanahan and Bia Echo. They are the seed funders, certainly not the only funders, and we need more money. The more money I can raise, the more money we can give away for grants. Um, and then I didn't talk about my work, but these are all the people that make it possible. So. Thank you so much, uh, Jennifer. I think we have uh, time for one question. Uh, I actually think that, okay, in the back there, someone is waving. Um, very energetically. I'm not seeing them. Oh. Just. Is it working? Oh. Um, I'm also a researcher in reproductive aging, and I really love your talk and your thoughts about the, the whole concept about equality. Um, I have a question about how we can approach the problem of ovarian aging. So basically, there are two ways to solve the problem. One is to target at the preservation of quantity of the oocytes, simply we suppress the activation of the primordial follicles. And the other way is to preserve the quality of the oocytes. And I'm, to be honest, I'm not sure which is the way to go. Do you have any thoughts know. about it? I don't know either. That's why we're funding projects in both directions. And I would say that um, you, know, you can split this into thinking about how to prevent um, you know, ovarian aging from that perspective, either you know, like slowing down recruitment of primordial follicles or, or changing the quality of the oocytes that are left. But then there's also a question of how to remediate for women who have already, you know, whose eggs are already old. And, I, you know, we're funding research all the way across that spectrum because we don't know where, where we're going to find the most important information. And um, that's the whole thing about basic science, right? You really just have to let scientists do their work. That's a great way to, and I think, I'm sorry, there's so many questions, okay. but I, we will have to move on. Uh, but please uh, post them on Slack or talk to Jennifer in the break. Let's give her a... Um.